Now, in answering, so let us first see, uh, say well, who is a secretary. Now, company secretary it is not an ordinary secretary of a company. So, company secretary is a very high position, it is an office rather than a kind of a uh, job uh, role. Every company shall have a direct secretary and the secretary's name should be uh, should be sent to the ROC, the registrar of company, so that the registrar deal directly with the secretary. Whenever the registrar wants certain information about the company, the registrar writes to the secretary. No person shall be appointed as a secretary of a company unless such person has in the prescribed form consent to be the secretary of such company. So, consent of a secretary is very important. So, that the secretary becomes binding on the company affairs to report specially to the ROC and certified that such person has such qualification as may be prescribed in relation that company have in regard to the nature of the duties the secretary will be called upon to discharge. Now, generally when it comes to qualifications of a secretary, attorneys at law, accountants and those who have done the secretarial examinations are competent secretaries and you need to get the license to function as a company secretary from the ROC. That is something of a certificate that you can obtain with your professional qualification. In the absence of further statutory requirements in which a company secretary should act, because our uh, statutory provisions with regard to company secretary is very, very, very small in the Companies Act. So, the legal position of a secretary was laid down in the case of Barnett and Company Limited versus South London Transways Company Limited, an English case. In this case, the court held that the secretary is mere an employee of a company who can do what he is told to do. This means the secretary does not have any apparent authority to bind the company in contracts with an outsider. Likewise, a director, a director can do, but a secretary cannot do. Only if the secretary has actual authority of the company then the company will be bound by the contracts entered into by the secretary on behalf of the company. So, for that the company should have given the necessary authorization to the secretary to act for those company affairs. Otherwise, it is the director board that have the power. However, the principle laid down in the above case was rejected in Panorama Developments versus Fidelis Fab Fab Fabrics Limited. In this case, now this is a landmark turning point. The court held that the secretary of the company is the chief administrative officer of the company, CAO, chief administrative officer of the company. Therefore, an outside is entitled to believe that he has authority to enter into transactions on behalf of the company which are purely administrative. Administrative contracts include purchasing stationers, stationaries, hiring vehicles for administrative purposes, recruiting employees, etcetera. Therefore, the secretary has an apparent authority to enter into such contracts and the company is bound by those contracts. So, now the Present status of a company is uh, secretary is, a dif is different from that that prevailed e earlier in the past. Now, the secretary, company secretaries are very authoritative, especially when it comes to administrative matters. They can enter into administrative contracts, such as purchasing of stationaries, hiring of vehicles for administrative purposes of the company, recruiting employees, and incidental there too otherwise connected. However, secretary does not have apparent authority 
to do the following activities. Though the secretary has the apparent authority to enter into such contracts as the companies like we, we, we discussed earlier and where the company becomes bound by such contract, but certain areas the uh, secretary does not have the apparent authority to rule. What are those? Borrow money on behalf of a company because that is more of a director's authority. Make trading contracts on behalf of a company that is also a director's competence. To delete names from the register of members that is with the shareholders. Then to call for a annual general, uh, general meetings, members meetings on his authority. It is also again either shareholders authority or directors authority. So, these kinds of things the secretary has no apparent authority, but for mere administrative purposes yes the secretary has authority to do so. Therefore, in answering the question even if the secretary has no actual authority to the first transaction the company will bind that transaction since the secretary has apparent authority in the absence of actual authority. The third person that deals with the secretary in allowing in, in giving the stationaries does think that the secretary has such authority, apparent authority. However, the company will not buy in the second transaction if the secretary has no actual authority to borrow money because borrowing money is vested on the directors. So, first transaction is ok whereas, the second transaction is not allowed. So, you see how you finally come into the answer and this is actually a situation where our statutory provisions do not have that much of detailed provisions with regard to secretary, but in the absence of that we take use of the common law situation, the common law of UK situation. The other last part of question 5 that carries 2.5 marks is Ratna and Arantha private limited is, an, is a, a, a part D that has Ratna and Arantha private limited is a newly incorporated company under the Companies Act. The board of directors are seeking the possibility of appointing the auditor before the next general meeting. Require advice concerning appointments of the first and subsequent auditors of the company. So, this is, this is a question based on appointing of auditors. Now, we know who are auditors. Auditors are the ones who conduct the financial uh, uh, financial uh, reporting in a company. <coughs> so, when it is a newly incorporated company, maybe that there is no annual general meeting yet being called, it has not passed one year. So, the board of directors now want to appoint an auditor prior to an annual general meeting. How can that be done at first instance and how after the AGM subsequent auditors of the company be appointed? <coughs> In answering, <coughs> an auditor is a person who will make proper financial analysis of the company's accounting and financial statuses. So, I am giving a certain introduction to the office of auditor. An auditor should be a competent accountant having the required qualifications while none of the following persons may be appointed or act as an auditor of a company. I am not talking about internal auditors, I am talking about external auditors here. So, a director or employee of a company cannot be appointed an external auditor. A person who is a partner or in the employment of a director or employee of the company cannot be appointed a auditor, cannot be appointed as an auditor. A liquidator or an administrator or a person who is received 
per in respect of the property of the company at time of liquidation or winding up cannot be appointed an auditor of the company of that company a body corporate also cannot be appointed as an auditor a person who by virtue of paragraph a b c may not be appointed or act as auditor of a related company even like a subsidiary or of the holding company whatever or uh, a merged a merger in a merger situation a partnership firm is eligible to be an auditor partnership firm is eligible to be an auditor such as fernando and silva auditors it's a partnership business not a company company you cannot act as a auditor Anyone failing under A, B, C above who has ceased to be such officer involved in that company is also unable to be an auditor for the next two years after ceasing of office in one of those categories as A, and a B and C, A, B or C. An auditor of a company shall in carrying out the duties of an auditor under this act ensure that his judgment is not impaired by reason of any relationship with or interest in the company or any of its subsidiaries. As per section 163, the auditor of a company shall make a report to the shareholders on the financial statements audited by him. It shall state the basis of his opinion on the financial status of the company. The scope and limitations of the audit, whether the auditor has obtained all information and explanations that was required. In the auditor's opinion, proper accounting records have been kept by the auditor. In the auditor, auditor's opinion, the financial statements given a true and fair view of the matters to which they relate and if they do not, the respects in which they fail to do so. If in the auditor's opinion the financial statement comply with the requirements of section 151 or section 153 give a true and fair view of the status, state of affairs, income, expenditure, loss, profit as in the case may be and if they do not the respects in which they fail to do so. Now all these things I had been clarifying you, uh, clarifying for you to have a good understanding of who is an auditor, what sort of duties are casted upon an auditor and what you expect out of auditor. Now in answering this question, you really may not have to go to that extent, but I have done it for the purpose of giving more clarity. This is the most important area that we need to address in the answer. That According to section 159 of the Companies Act number 7 of 2007, the first auditor of a company may be appointed by the board of the company before the first annual general meeting. So before the first annual general meeting, the director board must appoint or may appoint an auditor if they want to and if so appointed that auditor will hold office until the conclusion of that annual general meeting, the first annual general meeting. If the board does not appoint an auditor as stated, the company shall appoint the first auditor at a meeting of the company. However, neither the board nor the company shall be required to appoint an auditor in accordance with the provisions of this section. If a unanimous resolution is, is passed by the shareholders that no auditor be appointed. So, if the shareholders do not want an auditor to be appointed, then an auditor shall not be appointed so. Such a result by, by unanimous resolution of the shareholders. Such a resolution ceases to have effect at the commencement of the first annual gene. But such a resolution, unanimous uh, resolution of the shareholders ceases to have any effect with the commencement of the first annual general meeting. Because at the annual general meeting anyway, 
the company is obliged to appoint an auditor. Now, as per section 158, an auditor is not automatically reappointed also. If the person who is who it is proposed to replace him dies or is or becomes incapable or disqualified from being so appoint, appointed. <coughs> so, every time at the annual general meeting you need to appoint an auditor. He can be the same auditor who had acted in the previous year, that is not issue, but the members approval need to be obtained every year for the appointment of an auditor at the relevant age here. <coughs> Further an auditor of a company other than first auditor shall be deemed to be reappointed at an annual general meeting of the company that is what I said unless he is not qualified for appointment due to some breach that he has committed in relation to the company's act or for some other purpose for other reasons that he has acted in a wrong manner. The company passes a resolution at the meeting appointing another person to replace him as auditor. If that is so, a new auditor will be appointed. The auditor has given notice to the company that he does not wish to be reappointed on his own voluntary resignation line or not to be appointed, <coughs> reappointed. After the appointment of the first auditor, subsequent auditors are appointed at the annual general meeting of a company in, a, in each and every AGM by way of an ordinary resolution. Ordinary resolution. The auditor so appointed will hold office until the conclusion of the next annual general meeting. So, he cannot be removed in between unless he dies or he resigns on his own. However, if any ca casual vacancy in the office of auditor exists, the board of directors of the company will fill that vacancy in between like due to a death or due to resignation or whatever. An auditor can resign or cease to hold office for any reason. In such circumstances, he must deliver to the company a statement setting out the reasons connected with his ceasing to hold, why he is resigning. Because then the shareholders will know whether he is re re uh, resigning as a personal issue for the auditor or is it something to do with the company's conduct that he is not happy with the ongoing situation of the company. Failure to do so is an offence under the act as provided in section 161. So, that you can see. Then we come to the question 6. Now, this is another different style of a question. So, that is why I want you to follow this mock paper because it is not the same style that is repeating for every question. Now, you see question 6 carries 12, 20 marks, but part A carries 14. I will show you what are those 14. Because here in this part A, there are 14 considerations that you have to make. Now you see 14, altogether totally 14. And then the other question, part B carries the other 6 to make it 20. So, now let us look at this question. Now, this is mostly of determining the time allocations under the Companies Act, such as for example, what is the time period within which you need to have a annual AGM, annual general meeting. Now, in this question, Mrs. Rose is the first secretary of ABC Company Limited, first secretary of ABC Company Limited. That means, that has not yet gone for a AGM for the first time. It is a new company. A newly incorporated public com public company, it says public company, you have to be very careful there, has following issues regarding his general meetings. 
required to advise Mrs. Rose by considering the provisions contained in the Companies Act. In uh, answering this, you must now make sure that this is with regard to a company which is public, incorporated as public company and which has not gone to the first year of completion of first year. And Mrs. Rose is the first secretary who is now asking questions about certain things. What, are, what is she asking? The duration of the first annual general meeting of the company. So let me go one by one because you, it carries only one mark. I am not going to detail out all these things. I will be very specific and confined in my answers. The duration of the first annual general meeting of the company. What is the answer? In the case of a newly incorporated company, it is sufficient if the AGM, the first AGM is called within 18 months from its incorporation. That is the answer. Second, the duration of subsequent annual general meetings of the company. An AGM must be held by every type of company once in each calendar year. The maximum period that can pass between two successive AGMs is 15 months and it must be held not later than 6 months after the balance sheet date of the company. So, it can be held within 15 months between the last AGM and the new AGM, but not later than 6 months after the balance sheet date of the company. Balance sheet date to be like 30th, 31st of March or 31st of December, whatever, as the company wish so. Then the third one, the duration of notice to the shareholders of annual general meetings. How soon the notices of annual general meeting be sent to the shareholders. Notice of AGM to be given to every member of the company including shareholders at least 15 working days before the meeting, general meeting or AGM sorry, before the annual general meeting. Then how the company can convene the annual general meeting by a shorter notice? How can a company convene an AGM with a shorter notice? Normally 15 days, but if it is a shorter notice, how to do it? If a meeting is called as the AGM by a shorter notice and if all shareholders who are entitled to attend and vote all uh, at such general meeting, so agree to call the meeting by shorter notice, the AGM is deemed to have been duly called. That means if all the shareholders who are entitled to attend and vote such so agreed to call. So, then you can even call within five, 5 days, does not matter as long as you get the approval of all the shareholders for that. All the shareholders who have the right to attend and vote, not the non voting shareholders, but the voting shareholders. The duration of notice to shareholders of extraordinary general meetings, EGM, that, has, that are called may be in between two AGMs, previous and the new one. So, extra general, ordinary general meeting to discuss a very special matter. Any meeting other than AGM is of such nature that matters that should come within AGM are need to be addressed, then you need to call a EGM, Extraordinary General Meeting. Where an issue is raised and if it is very urgent and unable to wait until the next AGM, then EGMs are called. Generally to call an EGM in a private company, 5 working days notice should be given to the directors to to the directors, by the directors, to the shareholders, five working days notice. So, working days in the sense excluding the weekends and public holidays 
in which that the company is not working officially. In a public company, as in our case, 10 working days notice should be given. However, at the AGM, if any resolution is going to be passed, then not less than 15 working days notice shall be given in both companies, private and public. Then, how the company can convene the extraordinary general meeting by a shorter notice, like we discuss in AGM, now we discuss about the EGM. If a meeting is called as the EGM by a shorter notice, less than 10 or 5 working days with respect to public companies and private companies. Notice and if the share days notice, if the shareholders together hold it not less than 95 percent of voting rights who are entitled to attain and vote at such general meeting so agreed to call the meeting by short notice the EGM is due deemed to have been duly called. So if a public company trying to call a EGM less than 10 working days notice then 95 percent of those who are having the voting rights should agree to call the meeting by short notice, short notice, unanimous. Then who can convene an extraordinary general meeting? Who can convene? Directors of the company can convene EGM and EGM whenever they consider necessary members holding not less than 10 percent of votes can make a requisition of an EGM, then directors shall within 15 working days from the date of the requisition is handed to the registered office of the company must convene the meeting. The meeting must be held within 30 working days from the date of the requisition is handed to the registered office of the company. Where the directors do not duly proceed to call EGM, the requested parties or any of them representing more than 50 percent of the total votes of all of them may themselves call an EGM. Unless the articles do not provide otherwise to the contrary, two or more shareholders of the company holding not less than 10 percent of the votes may themselves call an EGM, where for any reason of it is not practicable to call a meeting in the manner prescribed in the act or articles, the court may either on its own motion or an application made by any member or director, the court may direct the company to hold a members meeting. So that is the answer, it is quite a long one, but you can give a shorter one as to the answer to the question who can convene an extraordinary general meeting in point form. Then the quorum for the general meeting of a public company quorum, the minimum number of members to be present. Now in the case of a private company, two shareholders, because that is the minimum number and in the case of any other company, public, three shareholders, three shareholders, presenting in person or by an agent, agent appointed by a proxy. Then, how the company pass a special resolution if without giving not less than 15 working days notice to its shareholders? How can the company pass a special resolution? If a notice has been issued without meeting the minimum requirement of 15 day working days notice. Then if it is agreed by shareholders who together represent in not less than 85 percent of the total voting rights at that meeting, a resolution may be proposed and passed as a special resolution at a meeting of which less than 15 working days notice has been given. So that is how you need to call. Then whether the company can pass resolution without convening general meetings answer is as per section 
144 without a general meeting but by way of written resolution signed by the shareholders you can call such a meeting this is known as circular resolution a resolution signed by not less than 85% of the shareholders who would be entitled to vote on that resolution at a general meeting and who together hold not less than 85% of votes entitled to be cast on that resolution is valid as if it is passed at general meeting who can demand a poll at a general meeting there is a common rule rule that on the declaration of the result of voting by show of hands a poll may be demanded as per section 140 of the companies act not less than 5 shareholders holding voting rights or a person or persons representing not less than 10% of the total voting rights can demand a poll that's the answer then how many votes shall have each shareholder when voting by show of hands and in a poll show of hands when voting by show of hand each shareholder shall have one vote in a poll every shareholder shall have one vote for each share held by them then how many votes yeah sorry delivery of annual return what is the time period to deliver annual return as per section 131 all companies are required to deliver an annual return containing details of specified details specified in the fifth schedule to the act such report shall be completed within 13 working days from the agm of the agm and sent to the roc register of companies then the last one here is the validity of the concept of constructive notice the validity of the concept of constructive notice the answer is constructive notice is a legal concept that implies that a person is has as a reasonable person should have known that fact even if he has no actual knowledge of it the companies act has specifically eliminated the concept of constructive notice as can be seen in section 22 which states that a person will not be affected by or deemed to have notice or acknowledge of the contents of the articles of the or the company's documents merely because it is delivered to the registrar for filing or that it is available at the company office for inspection so that is how we come to the end of that very different type of a question that related to mainly the time limits now let us see the question b part b of question 6 that carries 6 marks earlier one carried 14 marks now this carry 6 marks to make it 20 for for the question 6 part b question is abc plc a listed company has resolved to issue 100000 shares to the public listed company yeah, in the stock market and now is all to issue 100000 shares to the public further the management has decided to enter into an underwriting agreement with xy x plc an underwriter to secure the minimum subscription an underwriter is a company that undertakes kind of a insurance so now you are required to explain what is minimum subscription that carries 3 marks and what is underwriting agreement that carries 3 marks so answer to that is that let's take the minimum subscription minimum subscription means according to the opinion of the directors of the plc now the minimum amount that must be raised by the issue of shares how much you want to issue, to to raise for the company now with the public issuance of shares in the stock market for the following purposes the purchase price of any property or 
preliminary expenses or any commission is payable to the underwriter. The working capital or the payment of any money borrowed by the company in respect of aforesaid matters. So, minimum subscription is raised for either of those purposes I have mentioned from A to E. Then let us look at what is an underwriting agreement. Underwriting agreement. Now, given to x, y, z, p, l, c, if the minimum subscription was not received by the company, by a share issue, then it cannot allot of any share capital to the public, because their main purpose is not met by issuing of the 100,000 shares to the public, but that minimum requirement is not met, subscription. Therefore, to avoid this risk, company may make an underwriting agreement with another PLC company. An underwriting agreement is a contract made, bit, may, uh, may, uh, made between the company PLC and the underwriter, the other PLC. The main condition in such a contract is that the underwriter, that is the X, Y, Z PLC should purchase a specified number of shares to meet the minimum subscription if the public offer is not fully met. In the case, if all the shares or an adequate number of shares are not purchased by the public, so that the underwriter will receive. Now, underwriter will then give a pledge that it will buy the rest of the shares that were not sold were not purchased. The underwriter will receive a commission as consideration for that uh, undertaking. This commission becomes payable whether the underwriter is eventually called upon to purchase shares or not. That if there is an underwriting agreement that was made prior to a public offering of shares. with the fear that all those offered shares will not be uh, accepted by the public, then an underwriting agreement is therefore made before the public of offer of the shares as a kind of a defensive shield. If the shares are oversubscribed or sufficiently subscribed, then of course you no need to get the underwriter to purchase the shares. But however, you still have to pay the commission. Details with regard to underwriting commission should be set out in the prospectus. Prospectors that puts the intention to the public regarding the offer of the shares. So, question number 7. Now, question number 7 carries total of 20 marks, and these 20 marks are divided into 4 or uh, 5 marks each into 4 question, four parts. Part A, the capital of ABC PLC has consisted of ordinary shares, redeemable shares, redeemable preference shares and irremediable debentures. The company has decided to redeem its redeemable shares and reduce its ordinary shares by 2 percent. You are required to, now here 1 mark each but small, small questions. Explain the difference between ordinary shares and preferential shares. So, we will take for the first one. Ordinary shareholders are the owners of the company. 
they enjoy the residential profits of the company after having paid the preference shareholders and other creditors. The preference shareholders have a preference over the ordinary shareholders for receiving dividends, dividends and being paid off the capital in the event of liquidation. Second one, explain the meaning of irredeemable, irredeemable debentures. An irredeemable debenture is issued against long term loans repayable after a long period or on winding up of the company. Like what's, what Solomon bought in the Solomon versus Solomon and company case. In the Solomon and company, Solomon bought irredeemable debentures that stood a long time. Then next question, state the advantages of raising loan capital rather than share capital. Loan capital allows the company to maintain the ownership of its property. Therefore, even after the mortgage properties are owned by the company, loan capital unlike share capital does not share the ownership of the company. The debenture holder is an outsider. Interest payments on the mortgage are tax free because it is paid against that loan borrowed by the company. Repayments for the company is tax free. So, repayments should be predefined pre and determined where it allows the company to plan its budget. The lender will monitor the performance of the business of the company, but will have no control over the business. Once loan capital is repaid, it will benefit to gain profit. Debenture holder has to release the ownership once the loan repaid. Then explain the procedure of procedure of redemption of redeemable preference shares. How to redeem? A company can redeem its redeemable shares in three ways. As per section 67 in the opinion of the company. Here the board must pass a resolution stating that the redemption is in the interest of the company. The resolution to redeem the shares must be signed by the directors stating that the company will be able to meet the solvency test after the redemption. As per section 68, in the opinion of the holders of the shares, here the shareholder must give notice requiring the company to redeem the shares. The redemption will take place on the date mentioned in the notice or if no date mentioned in the date of receipt of the notice. Thirdly, as per section 69 on the date specified in the articles or in either of the ways, the redemption of the shares can be made possible. Then final one, explain the procedure of reduction of its ordinary shares, reduction of its ordinary shares. As per section 59, a company may reduce its stated capital either by passing a special resolution of shareholders or after publishing a public notice not less than 60 days before passing the resolution. Where the company agreed in writing with the creditor that the company will not reduce its stated capital below the specified amount without the prior consent of the creditor and if the company reduces its stated capital by breaching such an agreement, such reduction will be invalid and of no effect. After reduction, within 10 working days, the company shall give notice of the reduction to the register of companies by way of form 8. Then part B, if a single shareholder or a minor member of the shareholder filed a case on behalf of the company, such a case will not be entertained by the court because generally the majority rule exists in the company. This, is, this was held by Foss versus Harbottle that internal management of a company is purely internal to that company and the court will not intervene in such a matter. Required to explain five exceptions to the above rule. That means exceptions to the Foss versus Harbottle case. Now, under the common law, person acting in good faith and without knowledge 
of any irregularity who is dealing with a corporation need not inquire about the formality of the internal proceedings of the corporation, but is entitled to assume that there has been compliance with articles and bylaws. This principle known as the Indo management rule was authoritatively laid down in the 19th century case of Royal British Bank versus Turquoise and upheld the majority rule principle. A lawsuit brought by a shareholder of a corporation on its behalf to enforce or defend a legal right or claim which the corporation failed to do so. A derivative action more popularly known as a stock stockholder, a lawsuit brought by a shareholder of the corporation on its behalf to enforce or defend a legal right or claim which the corporation has, corporation has failed to do. A derivative action more popularly known as a stockholder's derivative suit is derived from the primary right of the corporation to seek redress of legal grievances through the courts. Derivative actions were a construction against the common law case of Foss versus Harbottle. According to the rule of Foss versus Harbottle, any action in which a wrong is alleged to have been done to a company, the proper claimant is the company itself. The exception to this rule is known as a derivative action. This allows a minority shareholder to bring a claim on behalf of a company as a wrongdoer controller and is reality and is in, in reality the only true exception to the rule. The rule in phosphorus or sabotel is best seen as the starting point for minority shareholder remedies. Because phosphorus or sabotel leaves the minority in an unprotected position. Exceptions have arisen and the statutory provisions have come into being which provide some protection for the minority. By far and away the most important protection is the unfair prejudice action in sections of the English law and Australia comparatively. Also there is a new statutory deviation action, deviation action available under the new companies act in UK as well as in Australia. These exceptions to the rule of Foss versus Arbottle arise where litigation will be allowed. The following exceptions protect basic minority rights which are necessary to protect regardless of the majority's rule. They include ultra virus and illegality. The directors of a company or shareholding majority may not use their control of a company to paper over actions which would be ultra virus the company or illegal. Actions requiring a special majority. if some special voting procedure would be necessary under the company's constitution or under the company's act. It would defeat both if that could be sidestepped by ordinary resolutions of a simple majority and no redress for aggrieved minorities to be allowed. Invasion of individual rights, frauds of minority rights, fraud in context of derivative action means abuse of power whereby the directors of majority who are in control of the company secure benefit at the expense of the company. So these are the exceptions to the first versus hard bottle. As per section 234 of the companies act, the court may on the application of a shareholder or director of the company grant leave to that shareholder or director to bring proceedings in the name and on behalf of the company or any subsidiary of the com that company or intervene in proceedings which the company or any subsidiary is a party for the purpose of continuing defending or discontinuing the proceedings on behalf of the company or subsidiary as the case may be. In determining whether or grant whether to grant or not to grant leave under that subsection, the court shall have regard to the likelihood of the proceedings succeeding, the cost of the proceedings in relation to the relief likely to be obtained, any action already taken by the company or subsidiary to obtain relief. The interest of the company or subsidiary in the proceedings being commenced, continued, defended or discontinued as the case may be. Leave to bring proceedings or intervene in proceedings may be granted only if the court is satisfied that either the company or subsidiary does not intend to bring diligent, con diligently continue, defend or discontinue the proceedings as the case may be. Or it is in the interest of the company or subsidiary that the conduct of the proceedings should not be left to the directors or to the determination of the shareholders as a whole. The court may at any time 
make any order it thinks fit in relation to any proceedings brought by a shareholder or a director with leave of the court under section 234 of the Companies Act in Sri Lanka and without limiting the generality of the powers conferred under this section may make an order authorizing the shareholder or any other person to control the conduct of the proceedings, give directions for the conduct of the proceedings, make an order requiring the company or directors to provide information or assistance in relation to the proceedings or make an order directing that any amount order to be paid by a defendant in the proceedings shall be paid in whole or in part to the former and present shareholders of the company or subsidiary instead of to the company or to the subsidiary as the case may be. So, this is a very comprehensive area, but ap appropriately for the answer you can select what are the real exceptions that apply to the FOSS versus Harbour Clause court non-interference of internal management of a company. Now, part C. Part C is managing director of RDB manufacturers PLC aware that the company can wind up by the court for some reason. He believes that in such winding up process, court will appoint a liquidator to displace the directors of the company. However, MD does not aware of the reasons and procedures of winding up by court. Required to explain such situations and procedures to the MD of RDB. Answer is this is about winding up and dissolution. So, I give a, a, a basic uh, 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 outline of what uh, dissolution or winding up all about. Dissolution of a corporation is the termination of a corporation. Dissolution of a corporation is carried out by filing documents to withdraw the corporation as a business entity. Dissolution can be either stated voluntarily by resolution of the shareholders or voluntarily for not settling the creditors or by court for certain determined causes. To dissolve a company also known as dissolution or striking off is a way in which company can remove its name from the official register and once the name is refused, removed, the company no longer exists. As per section 316 of the Companies Act, number 7 of 2007, where the affairs of a company have been completely wound up, the court shall, where the liquidator makes application in that behalf, make an order that the court be dissolved, uh, may the, com the company be dissolved from the date of such order and the company shall be dissolved accordingly. A copy of the order made under these provisions shall within 15 days from the date of such order be forwarded by the liquidator to the register who shall make in his books a minute of the dissolution of the company. Therefore, dissolution of a company commences with winding up process. As per section 267, the winding up of a company may be done either by court, voluntary or subject to the supervision of court. Now, our question is mainly on the basis that how to wind up by court. So, I have provided here the winding up by court procedure. As per section 270, a company may be wound up by court if the company has by special resolution resolved that the company be wound up by court. Now, this is what the MD has to take connivance of. The company does not commence its business within a year from its incorporation or suspends its business for one year. If the number of the members are falls below the minimum number required under subsection 2 of, subsec of section 4 of this act, the company has no directors. The company is unable to pay its debts or the court is of opinion that it is just and equitable that the company should be wound up. So, these are the grounds on which a company may be wound up by court. A company shall be deemed to be unable to pay its debts further clarifies where a creditor by assignment or otherwise to whom the company is indebted in a sum exceeding 50,000 rupees then due has served on the company by leaving it at the register the office of the company. A demand under his hand required the company, requiring the company to pay the sum so due and the company has for three weeks from the date of so leaving, neglected to pay the sum or to secure or compound for it to the reasonable satisfaction of the credit. Execution of other process issued on a judgment, decree or 
order of any court in favor of a creditor of the company's return unsatisfied in whole or in part. Or it is proved to the satisfaction of the court that the company is unable to pay its debts and in determining whether the company is unable to pay its debts, the court shall take into account the contingent and prospective liabilities of the company. So now how the application should be made, an application to the court for the winding up shall be made by petition presented subject to the provisions of this section either by the company or by any creditor or creditors including any contingent or prospective creditor or creditors, contributory or contributories or by all or any of the parties jointly or separately. Here a contributory means every shareholder of the company and uh, every other person liable to contribute to the assets of a company in the event of its being wound up. The court shall not The court shall not give a hearing to a winding up petition presented by a contingent or prospective creditor until such security for cost has been given as the court thinks reasonable and until prima facie case for winding up has been established to the satisfaction of the court. The court shall not make a winding up order on the petition unless it is satisfied that the voluntary winding up or the winding up subject to supervision could be continued with due regard to the interest of the creditors and contributory once the official receiver attached to the court as the will as well as by the other person authorized report. So, thereafter the court can appoint the liquidator who will take steps accordingly in the winding up process and finally the dissolution of the company. So, then I come to the last question that carries 5 marks in question number 7. Now, this question among other things land rec restriction on alienation act number 38 of 2014 is enacted to provide provisions to restrictions on the alienation of lands in Sri Lanka to foreign companies and certain institutions with foreign shareholding. We are required to explain the duty of the company secretary in such situation under this act. Where the answer is sorry. Where the title of land is transferred to a company incorporated in Sri Lanka under the Companies Act with less than 50 percent of foreign shareholding, it shall be the duty of the register of lands to confirm himself by requiring the secretary of such company to submit documentary proof with regard to that. So, the corporate secretary can be asked to submit the documentary proof of such where the title of land is transferred to a company incorporated in Sri Lanka under the company that with less than 50 percent of foreign shareholding because that is the normal case you have to start with less than 50 percent uh, foreign shareholding. The company secretary to the relevant company shall thereafter inform the register of lands in writing in every six months, every six months commencing from, commencing from the date of the resignation of the relevant deed of transfer that the foreign shareholding of such company has not exceeded 50 percent of the total number of shares issued by such company during the said period of 6 months. Because the moment that it exceeds then that company is not eligible to hold immovable property as per Sri Lanka's law of land uh, this act land restriction on alienation act number 38 of 2013. So, here we come to the end of the structured questions answer, sir, answers that we have done in uh, uh, done up to question number 7. Now, I would like to go back to uh, where we stopped in the MCQ area the, uh, the last time and we stopped here. So, here select the correct statement for offshore company and put X mark in front of the cage. What is the correct statement? It must be incorporated under companies act number 7 of 2007, offshore companies that is correct. It may be incorporated in a country other than in Sri Lanka that is wrong because then that company is then the parent company. It need not be uh, registered as an offshore company. It can perform business activities in Sri Lanka. No offshore company, none of the above. So, the correct answer is 
with regard to offshore company, it must be incorporated under the Companies Act number 7 of 2007. Then select the incorrect statement for offshore company, incorrect statement and put x in front of the cage overseas company. It has no limitations to carry on commercial trading or industrial activity in Sri Lanka with regard to overseas company that is wrong. It cannot issue prospective by inviting to purchase shares or debentures within Sri Lanka can yes. The financial in, in the statements shall comply with form and content as required of a company incorporated under companies act number 7 of 2000 that is also correct. The name of the company shall comply with the rules as required company incorporated under the Companies Act that is also correct. So, the answer is A. Then question number 6, they are MCQ. According to the land restrictions or an alienation act number 38 of 2014, what we discussed previously, the transfer of title of any land situated in Sri Lanka shall be prohibited if such transfer is made to a company incorporated in Sri Lanka which in which foreign shareholding is less than 50 percent. No. To a foreign company which is right because according to this act the transfer of title of land situated in Sri Lanka shall be prohibited shall be prohibited if such transfer is made to a foreign company that is the correct answer none of the above other. Then a person resident outside Sri Lanka is not permitted to invest in shares of a company incorporated in Sri Lanka carry on any business of coastal shipping. Because coastal shipping is a internal matter for the Sri Lanka sovereignty. Deep sea fishing is outside Sri Lanka's it is within it is it is outside Sri Lanka's uh, uh, own type of entitlement. Coastal for coastal shipping, no outside resident. Resident outside Sri Lanka is permitted to invest. In deep sea fishing, yes. Air transportation also yes. Education also yes. Because all those three areas are now being uh, uh, liberalized, so that the foreign partnership for foreign part participation is allowed whereas for coastal fishing still foreign participation is not allowed. Then the next question a person resident outside Sri Lanka may invest in shares of a company incorporated in Sri Lanka carrying on on a business of air transportation is only up to of the stated capital of such company 10 percent, 20 percent, 40 percent percentage authorized by it is solely the percentage authorized by the government. There is no strict percentage that is being provided. So, it is the percentage authorized by the government that is the correct answer. Next one 9, the outward investments investment limit for setting up of overseas officers is in any foreign currency designated by central bank per calendar year of a company with regard to a company the outward investment limit for setting up of overseas officers per year can be USD 300,000 maximum. Then for an individual only 200,000 US dollars. Now, we come to the last question, question number 8 of the MCQ. According to the Companies Act, which of the following statement is, in, is correct? If a company has subsidiaries, should prepare group financial statements? No. If the subsidiary is wholly owned, it is not required to prepare group financial statements, it is right. Must be prepared in the same form and carry the same content as the company's accounts. Wrong. All are correct. Wrong. No, there is a answer. If the subsidiary is wholly owned, it is not required to prepare group financial statements. It can come in one uh, holding company uh, uh, account. So, that is the answer. So, I think having considered all these areas in the mock paper, uh, I am sure that you are confident to answer uh, your examination paper that is coming up next week for the corporate law CL4. 
uh, I have covered extensively and you will see that uh, this particular question paper looks like it's going to cover all the areas that we have discussed in class in our lecture. So, I advise you to follow all the classes that we have conducted up to now and the areas that we have covered because it looks like that questions are going to come from all corners of company law in Sri Lanka. So, with that I come to the end of uh, our special session we conducted for the mock examination paper of CL4 corporate law. Uh, heading to the examination conducted by the chartered institute uh, chartered accountants of Sri Lanka so instead of chartered accountants of Sri Lanka. So, uh, what I would like to emphasize is that as I told you before select the more convenient more easiest questions that you are more comfortable with to answer first and then go to the more difficult one. Take more time to select those questions uh, because you have ample time within the allotted time period to utilize maybe 5, 10 minutes to decide on what questions you would answer 1, 2, 3 like that. So, better before answering any question leave out all your pens and pencils away. <coughs> Sorry, Read the entire question paper right from the beginning up to the end. I would advise if I were you I would re read three times at least this question paper when I get it and after reading all that three times then I will go to select which question I am going to answer first. Do not always think that MCQs are easy and that you can give some answers uh, uh, provide the answers. Some MCQ questions may not be so familiar and you may have doubt. So, in that case better you leave out those questions also until you come to a certain juncture that you can answer that particular MCQ. Any out of the structured type of questions you better select the best questions that you are more comfortable with and then you build up confidence in throughout answer in the examination paper to answer one by one very appropriately and diligently and I have given you way in which answers can be comprehensive questions can be comprehensively answered and questions that can be uh, moderately answered. So, it is up to you to decide that, but if you need more and more marks in order to pass your exam, you better get ready to comprehensively answer, but answer what that has been questioned. So, with that I wish you all the very best in your exam that is going to happen next week. I am sure and confident that you all can uh, have good marks, pass grades by following all my lectures during the series as well as the two mock sessions that I have done uh, discussing the entire mock paper too, uh, which I have some doubt that I have uh, rather believe that uh, your question paper will be very very similarly modeled and styled in accordance with this mock paper too. So, all the very best, thank you very much.